We haven't seen the U.S. label China currency manipulator since 1994. So, Joe, give us a sense of how significant this move is. Well, uh, from a practical standpoint, uh, there are no penalties that are immediately imposed because of this, uh, and the law uh, encourages the U.S. to enter into negotiations uh, with whoever is the currency manipulator. Now, those negoti negotiations are already going on, uh, but this is a significant escalation uh, and gives uh, China less of a chance to back down and is making clear that uh, the President Trump is ready to double down on this trade conflict with China. Uh, it is liable to have, uh, obviously, some repercussions in financial markets, uh, but it also signals that this is going to be a long trade war without any, uh, any immediate sense of where it's going to go and how it might end. Uh, the additional tariffs that the president is uh, threatening to impose on China uh, will affect the consumer goods, and that will have uh, an impact in the U.S. Uh, in terms of prices uh, for, uh, for voters leading up into the uh, 2020 election. Uh, and then we'll have to see what the overall impact of the economy ultimately will be. Uh, but this is, uh, it's very clear that, that uh, Trump is, is in no mood to back down uh, or soften his stance in an attempt to get negotiations. Uh, moving. Yeah, we're just hearing uh, that uh, Peter Navarro says the first step on uh, labeling China a currency manipulator is now to be working with the IMF. So uh, here we have it, uh, less than 24 hours after China lets the yuan slip through seven, uh, we have uh, the U.S. labeling China a currency manipulator. Uh, Tom McKenzie in Beijing, have we had any response yet from the PBOC? Uh, not to the currency manipulator label, no, not yet. But we did hear from the PBOC governor in a statement last night, Beijing time, saying that China and the PBOC do not intervene in their currency markets uh, in as a tool in the trade war. They were trying to emphasize that this was a market-denominated or market-derived move that we saw uh, yesterday in talking more about the, the market and economic fundamentals. And, of course, when we spoke to Yi Gung back in June, June, he kind of gave us a signal that seven was not a line in the sand. He pushed back against that idea and gave us a, a sense, something of a heads up, really, to what we saw yesterday, saying there was no specific number uh, for the currency. Uh, of course, there are risks uh, to this approach by the PBOC, allowing this depreciation of the currency, because there are concerns now there'll be a focus on capital flight. We do have increased capital controls in place here in China since 2015, when we saw that surprise depreciation. But whether or not those controls will be enough to stop capital flight will now be squarely in focus. The other uh, concern as well is that there is a mounting pile of US dollar denominated debt owned by Chinese corporations. And of course, if you have a weaker yuan versus the US dollar, then that pushes and puts that debt under pressure and how they pay that off will be in focus as well. It's more than doubled that holding of US dollar denominated debt since 2015. Of course, it may have some benefits for China's exporters marginally around the edges. Uh, but again, the risks are also there for China and its PBOC. Joe, Peter Navarro also saying right now that there are countervailing tools that the U.S. can use. So this really gives rise to more concerns that the U.S. actually might take action and intervene. What could we see? Well, there's uh, been suggestions that uh, the Trump administration uh, would attempt to do something uh, in terms of the dollar's valuation. The president has called on the Fed to do something, though uh, it, it would also have to be through the Treasury Department. Uh, this would mark a departure from longtime U.S. policy of, of being in favor of a strong dollar, uh, and uh, it would have some impact, uh, uh, ripple effects with uh, other trading partners as well, if, if that were to, to come about and uh, possibly trigger some other retaliatory moves by uh, other countries as well. Uh, so uh, there are stepping fairly delicately here, but um, we are seeing that they are, are willing to, to put the tariffs on China uh, to move ahead with that, uh, with that trade dispute. Uh, and uh, there are a number of other deals that have been working, although by comparison, because of the size of China's economy, uh, they are uh, not nearly as, as significant as the trade conflict is with China. 
Yeah, Tom, uh, that story was rather lost in all the noise of uh, the action with the currency. So in terms of uh, deciding to no longer take those agricultural products from the US, what other retaliatory steps might China be considering? Well, currently China has tariffs, retaliatory tariffs, on about $110 billion worth of U.S. imports into China. It imports about $130 billion U.S. dollars. So there's scope there, limited scope for additional tariffs that China could put on those U.S. imports. That's something that we will certainly be looking at. But in terms of the concerns for U.S. corporates operating here and with a big footprint in China, you only need to look at the stock prices of companies like Apple or IBM, which, of course, derive a lot of their revenues from the Chinese market. You've seen those under pressure as a result of these escalating trade tensions. And, of course, that draws out the question as to whether or not these companies will face retaliatory measures here in China as well, non-tariff barriers. Will there be deals that will be scrapped? Will there be increased oversight from officials, licensing questions? All of those things will be in focus, and there'll be mounting concern amongst the U.S. corporate business group here, operating here in China, as these tensions continue uh, to escalate. Uh, in terms of additional measures that China could take, of course, U.S. Treasury holdings have been a big focus as well. Whether or not China will significantly sell down those U.S. Treasury holdings, of course, there are all sorts of economic and financial impacts from any such move, and it is being held as a last-ditch option for China. We may be looking at whether or not China indeed goes ahead with sending its delegates to D.C., as had been originally planned in September. That's the next question. Do these talks continue, given this sharp escalation in tariffs and trade tensions, I should say, that we've seen just in the last few days?